that it, it has to be it has to be something they have to attack this from every which way san francisco set out to unwind the problems that have become a crisis over our, you know we, we can't keep up from daily efforts to get people off of sidewalks to a crackdown on drug dealers it's an evolving effort to save a neighborhood and lives some people live and die on the street if you know what i mean by that Tonight, we check in on San Francisco's attempt to break the cycle of misery in the Tenderloin. We can do better than this, and we're going to continue to try. Good evening. Over the next half hour, we're going to check in on San Francisco's emergency effort to improve conditions in the Tenderloin. Something that started about 16 months ago with a speech that drew a lot of attention. And less tolerant of all the that has destroyed our city. So the city mobilized to tackle the problems that had mounted over decades, homelessness, the exploding drug crisis, the growing presence of drug cartels, and a sense that things were spinning out of control. Last spring, we took a dive into what was at the time a state of emergency in the Tenderloin, and here we are a year later. So what's changed, what's working, and what's not working? Wilson Walker has an update on what is now the Tenderloin Emergency Initiative. What is happening in this neighborhood has drawn attention from around the world over the last year, while residents live with it every day. This is a dynamic neighborhood. What's happening on any given corner can change very quickly. And how things are changing over time may depend on who you ask and when. It's almost every day. They have a mess over here. It's been nice the last, I will say, about four weeks. Things are cleaner. Every day a little different here. There are some things changing, but real and lasting change was always going to depend on finding ways to help those that are struggling out here. So that's where we're going to start. Someone who gets up every day tasked with making that happen. Nobody should have to live like this. And nobody should have to walk through this. You know, this, this pathway right here, kids take to the playground up the street. Trying to manage a situation some might think impossible. Mark Meza with the San Francisco Department of Emergency Management. And as the Tenderloin Streets Operation Manager, he sees a lot of these streets. They're going to go to O'Farrell. Do a lot of walking, yeah, probably about 50 miles a week. And all of the walking reflects a shift in city strategy. This one driven by the December closure of what debuted as the Tenderloin Linkage Center. Once the Tenderloin Center closed, um, we had to focus 100% on bringing those services to the street. So that's when we just, we divided the neighborhood into four different areas and every day we work that area. We go through seven days a week. HSH, DPH, DPW, we clean up. We offer to get people to shelter. We do wellness checks. If somebody has somewhere to live already or if they're already sheltered, we try to get them back there. It's a slow day by day, case by case process. That often means revisiting the same people in the same tents for months with occasional breakthroughs. Oh, yeah, we had somebody who uh, it was a couple, and uh, we had a couple of navigation center beds down in the Bayview. But then there is the scale of the challenge in a city with an unsheltered homeless population of about 4,400. We, we can't keep up. We can't keep up. There's so much need out here and not enough of us to help. And, I mean, everybody out here doesn't want to be out here. Occasionally, if the police would hit, like, catch you nodding out someplace or something, they would take you to a navigation center. Abe has been in San Francisco for about 10 years, almost all of it on the street. He says he is seeing more offers for help. It, they just started going out to people for COVID. So you're noticing more outreach? Yeah. So why is he still on the street? Well, he says it comes down to the available options, and that is something Mesa hears just about every day. This group is, you know, we experience a lot where they would go inside if they were eligible for what they want. They, they want hotel rooms and they don't meet the eligi eligibility requirements. So they want to stay out here. It's totally bullshit. They, they go up and they want you to throw away all your personal property and like drop everything and go with them and um, go to like a dorm where they're just like stacking. It's like a mental house in there for real. And, you know, I can't. I can't blame people for not wanting to go into a congregate shelter. That's their decision. And that's just one example of how resolving any single case can be difficult under very difficult circumstances for everyone. These guys are out here every day. 
working hard, often getting yelled at. Not, not just people are mad at them on the streets. People who are housed are mad at them. It's the people that are actually the hardest workers are the ones that are being shafted at this. Why Alex Alvarado may not be yelling at city workers, but he is frustrated. He was one of the neighbors we met last year, and at the time, he was relatively encouraged, at least by the street cleaning efforts. Having the clear path to be able to see a couple of blocks down is a blessing. One year later, if, if, if we didn't clean here, this place would be a complete disaster. It takes more, it takes an, an army. An army. It takes an army. And we don't want to see the army in the streets of San Francisco. That's for sure. We also spoke with Stu Barkuki about the struggle to run his deli. One year later, he tells us it was all just too much. He sold and moved on, but others are digging in. You know, people have been loving and caring for Tenderloin since probably the beginning of time. And you can see all these little signs and you don't get that in any other neighborhood in San Francisco. Azalina Yusopi proudly boasts of being a fifth generation street food vendor. Yeah, I immigrated to the United States about 20 years ago. So I really fit in in this neighborhood. You know, this is kind of... Opening the restaurant means running the infamous gauntlet of city fees, rules and regulations and almost impossibly stark contrast to the disorder she was seeing outside after being spit on by someone camping in her doorway, she joined a group of business owners demanding help from the mayor's office. If you're placing a regulations or rules of that's a process that needs to be followed, it has to be equally distributed and, and everybody have to act the same way. And I, I just feel like that's what's just missing here. Saving the tenderloin has meant different things over the years, and now for entrepreneurs like yourself, that means finding a way to make this neighborhood a viable place to run a business. Should I say fight? Maybe that's not really the positive word, but it's going to take a lot of loud voices from small people like us. When we take the steps to be more aggressive, Think back a year, there was a lot of debate over the role of police in this neighborhood. Well, that is a change that neighbors are seeing now. Finally, the police, I, I guess uh, she just giving them the okay, because all of a sudden, arrests are up, but prosecutors face new challenges with those cases and new obstacles for the outreach team. The things that kept them safe out here get them right, right back out on the street. Our coverage from the Tenderloin continues in a moment. This is the Tenderloin the toughest place in town. The San Francisco policeman once told me, we don't try to control the tenderloin, we just try to contain it. The great Dave McElhatton, talking about the challenges of facing the neighborhood in 1977. Four decades later, San Francisco police are still trying to control it, in this case, the drug market that exploded in recent years. When Mayor London Breed announced the tenderloin emergency, it was her pledge to be more aggressive by using law enforcement. But some significant po po policing changes haven't really come until recently, and that's where Wilson Wilk Walker picks up our coverage. Extra baggies. More fentanyl. A typical bust made by a six-member undercover team launched in November, and just days later, more arrests at the very same corner. Can you speak English? Oh, you're Spanish? Yeah. English? There are new rules. A uniformed officer must be on hand, but it's not slowing them down. At the start of April, Tenderloin Station had made 217 arrests, putting them on pace to pass last year's total by more than 50%. We have recovered triple the amount of uh, drugs year to date as opposed to last year. Um, we have charged almost double the amount of cases in the period since I took over compared with that period the previous year. District Attorney Brooke Jenkins began her tenure by coming to this neighborhood and promising action against drug dealing. And while the busts are really old fashioned police work, they are hitting challenges. Complaints were filed against one officer alleging he was unfairly targeting Latinos. Officers say they are simply targeting fentanyl and problematic corners. And as for prosecutors, their drug cases are just now reaching courtrooms, and the first two ended with hung juries. The defense that was offered in both of those cases is that uh, the, the defendant had been trafficked, um, and that's why they were selling narcotics. 
This is a new issue. Uh, when I was handling drug dealing cases five years ago, uh, there was no allegation that anyone was being trafficked, so it's something that we are having to adapt to rapidly. We're not going to have any more luck arresting our way out of that crisis by busting street-level dealers than, than any prior administration has had or that this country has had. Supervisor Dean Preston, whose district now includes a portion of the Tenderloin, is among those who wonder whether this will ultimately be effective, but it's not hard to find those in the neighborhood who say the arrival of the police, at least on their corner, is long overdue. Uh, um, we have tried to call the we have tried to call the police um, uh, many times, but uh, before uh, sometimes they come, but sometimes they not. So that's why uh, right now it's really better the police on the streets right now. They've been throwing a lot of rest. I, I see them blocking off sh and running these uh, uh, the dope dealers to different corners. They are. Last year we heard from neighbors who said that civilian patrols like Urban Alchemy only pushed issues around the neighborhood, and now with the targeted police patrols. They moved them all the way up to Post Street almost. So they move them block to block, or they move them around the block. We'll meet you at the station. If you haven't addressed the underlying causes and reasons that folks are out there dealing, if you haven't invested in the community, uh, you're just moving people around. Even though the sellers may move around and others engage in criminal activity, we're gonna stay on top of them and on top of what they're doing, regardless of where they go. So police are making more arrests, taking on a wave of drug dealers. The results in the justice system and in the neighborhood remain to be seen. Police don't make, uh, uh, they need to make more walking, you know, uh, walking around. Uh, uh, at least scare these guys, you know. We all know the Tenderloin is rough territory, but lately it's been a lot rougher on the criminals. Twice in the past three weeks, the residents around here have been fighting back against crime. That is another kind of timeless part of all this. Neighbors looking for their own ways to fight back against some of these problems. And lately, a lot of them are doing it just by making some noise. Before I start doing this, all these people that's over there that's using drugs at the moment, they all was using the drugs right here. For J.J. Smith, it started with things like today? clearing a path for right. school kids, checking on neighbors, building relationships with those on the street. Give them that little support. Nah, man, let's not do that. Let's not, don't get high today. You want some rehab? You want treatment? I could call somebody for you. And after a while, he too hit something of a breaking point. It's not normal, but it is normal. So he set out to change normal by showing it to everyone. He turned his Twitter account into a raw, no apologies chronicle of life and death in this neighborhood. The suffering on the street, the violence, the drugs, and the casualties. I just want my voice to be heard. I want people to see what I see. Understand what I deal with every day when I walk out my door. I felt I had to kind of use what I, you know, the tools I had to do something to sort of fight back turning several lenses on a problem, a now growing collection of neighbors who are connecting via closed circuit security cameras. Ben has been for 30 years and I've been a resident of the Tenderloin for 29 years. Basically shock that what I saw was going on, um, nothing was really being done about it. So they turned the focus on the blatant open air drug trade that has consumed their blocks and put it online. TL tube Twitter account, there's a regular, he's out there all the time, and there's, he's using a mule. It was something that people would just deny. You know, they would say, well, that's not going on, but there it is. You know, just look at it. You can see the drugs. You can see what's happening. They say the dealers eventually saw what was happening as well, and a funny thing happened. They were well aware of it. Um, they have moved their operations up a block. The cameras shuffled the problem down the street, so now more neighbors are reaching out to build similar systems. So it does give me hope that, you know, us as residents can do something to kind of make change. I would not recommend anybody just do this. It's a very dangerous activity. Hey, Paul. But for a lot of people, the current up, situation has created a sense that even if risky or unpopular, they have to say something. Because I am a tenant and I am a resident. I can place myself in the business people's shoes because I was once a business owner. And I can place myself in the homeless and in addicts people's shoes because my family has been like that. My brother was like that. So I understand what everybody is going through. I can see it and I can feel it. It's, 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 it's kind of a hard thing to say because I, I'm not used to 
what other people are used to, which is being inside. Coming up, the outreach work rolls on, but getting someone inside is only the first step. And how is this all adding up? I, I can't even speak to that because we've got so, such a long ways to go. Our look at San Francisco's emergency effort in the Tenderloin continues in a moment. People weren't always, initially they were directly connected to services to some capacity. But, you know, that wasn't always happening. We had all of the different services at one location, and that wasn't completely translating to help in other locations. I mean, this Tenderloin Center was not perfect, right? There were many things, if I were running it, that I would have done very differently. But we should have, when we closed it, had two more opening in the community. The Tenderloin Lincoln Center opened and closed to controversy. It was the city's first de facto safe use site, and the discussion over how or where to open another one continues. And the drug crisis isn't just complicating the effort to get people off the streets. It is driving it in many cases. And that's where we pick up with a team that is trying to help. It is officially time. Day in. Urban Alchemy is on the lower TL, so a lot of, they've moved a lot of things up. So now Ellis, O'Farrell, that's where we're seeing a lot more people. And, you know, pe people, people go where the drugs are. In this day-by-day, camp-by-camp effort to connect people on the street with some kind of shelter, there is the one element that looms over just about everything. Amphetamine with naloxone, and it's a white, like, speed rock. It kind of mimics cocaine. There's complicated pieces, and there, there's some that are pretty obvious and, and people out here will be clear with us about. They're addicted to drugs that they need to be using constantly. Like, I'm surprised I'm not even dead yet and I'm 40 years old, you know, and stay here. And Philip arrived in the city from Puerto Rico with his mother when he was just two years old. And uh, ever since then I've been out here in San Francisco. And, uh, and when did you end up on the street? When I was 11. 29 years later, he says the street is all he knows. To keep warm at night, you know, so I'm not so cold and icy in the morning. And when he's been placed in shelter or housing, he has struggled. It's, it's very weird because it's like, I'm not used to this inside environment that they're giving me, you know what I mean? It's like, I want to be somewhere where I'm comfortable. Part of being comfortable, he says, means staying alive. Like the drugs that I do, because I do heavy drugs, and I do opiates and, you know, and for people to do them type of drugs can end up living and dying on the streets, you know, and it's real easy. As in there's someone there to save you. Correct. Right. And that's why we keep coming back and trying to catch them at the right time when they're ready to, to do something different. There are, of course, other challenges to keeping people in housing. And, and hoarding and cluttering disorders are a real thing. They have been working on exactly that kind of case lately, someone who has been out here for more than 10 years. But we did have a breakthrough last week, and he agreed to go to a, a shelter a few blocks away. But just days later, that individual came right back to the same corner and their familiar ways, collecting an entire sidewalk's worth of items pulled from garbage and recycle bins. So the team just asked if they would like to go back home. He agreed. He said he, he didn't need any of the stuff. He had gone through it. He didn't want to take any of it with him. He gets walked home by outreach. Uh, he's somewhere warm now. The streets are clean. People can pass through. Nobody's walking through the street. So there are steps forward and backward for any number of reasons. What happens out on the street and what keeps people safe gets them kicked out of housing. You, if you want to stay out here, you, you need to be scary. You need to, you need to be able to yell at people. You need to be loud to keep people away from you. So unless we're working on that out here on the street, when people go indoors, the things that kept them safe out here get them right, right back out on the street. You have a lot of people churning through housing? 100%. But for as hard as it can be to find housing and get someone placed in it, the city is having a much harder time with something else, and that is getting people into successful drug treatment or recovery. Are uh, you, you interested in any kind of drug treatment? <laughs> um, that's funny because, you know, it was asked to me a couple times before this uh, if I was interested, and I gave, I gave a blank, you know, answer to that because because it's hard. The opiates that I do, I gotta, you know, detox and the things that I withdraw through, it's, it's not a good feeling. So I'd probably leave that in an unquestionable, you know, answer, so. If we're ever gonna make a dent in this, we, we need some type of quality treatment that people are interested in going into. To, to, it, it, people are out here because they're on drugs. There's, there's places for people to go when they're ready. 
there's housing, there's, there's money for people that aren't eligible for housing. Like we, we are trying to get people off the streets, but the drugs are keeping them out here. So much work to be done, so much need out there. So how can we tell if any ground is being gained? Same goes for police enforcement or the effort to keep the sidewalks clean. Thoughts on measuring progress when we continue. It's a it's a it's a wonderful community. I love I love my city. Don't get it wrong, I was born right here. I love San Francisco. But it just it's complicated sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Andre Harris there with a the thought any San Franciscan may have said out loud at some point and complicated is something this neighborhood has been for a long time. My overall goal is to see the Tenderloin, a place where people can live in peace and safety. Not just peace and safety, the trash and litter alone is something neighbors in the city have been trying to corral for generations. A solid community that really wants to improve its image and get away from dirt and litter and debris. But it's still uh, the same. No changes. No changes. It's still the same, you see? You see the broken glass, a lot of mess every day. The Tenderloin is where fixing problems can feel like turning back the tide and measuring progress can be difficult. Business owners come to my officers on a daily basis and thank them. You probably say, you guys are pretty successful in this location and why not at this location? I hear that a lot. But you do too, though. I do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The whole department here. So. We, we can't keep up. We can't keep up. There's so much need out here and not enough of us to help. As for all the outreach we've been showing you over the past half hour, that is translating into some numbers. The city has been placing anywhere from two to 300 people, sometimes more, into some type of housing every month. And those numbers are a bit higher than what we've seen in years past. You know, I think we're starting to see some visible differences on the streets. We can't you know, quantify that until the count, but it's certainly, um, if you look at the numbers, they're, they're doing a lot of placements. Then there is how to take some control over the drug crisis. Discussions on that topic now draw packed houses with residents increasingly frustrated by the lack of better outcomes for those we see on the sidewalks. And the people who are on the sidewalk should know that there's people coming out here trying to help them get indoors. And when they get that opportunity, whether it's to go into housing or go into treatment, whatever it is, they deserve something that's high quality and they deserve people that will be there to help them get back on track. I just okay. want people to see how much work is going on out here and how hard people are trying. The tenderloin is going to be the tenderloin, but th this is unacceptable. That is one thing that has not changed since last year. The sense of urgency, the feeling that more people are paying attention and looking for ways to push this neighborhood forward. I know it's a long shot, but I feel like there's a change that's happening. And we all, if we all have that, I, we might get this balance. We don't have to wait another 60 years. So I think uh, we need to fix this, uh, this matter on the Tenderloin. That's only I can, uh, I can say. And well said. I want to thank all of the neighbors who took some time to talk with us, show us what's going on. And that certainly goes for the folks out here who are experiencing some very tough situations. San Francisco faces some immense challenges right now. And in many respects, this neighborhood sits at the middle of all of it. Finding answers here is something the rest of the city may very well depend on.